Manchester's population has swelled by almost 10% in the last decade. That increase in people has provoked a drastic transformation of the city's skyline. The number of people who call Manchester home is expected to continue to rise in the coming years. As the city grows in popularity and prosperity, a great deal more homes will be needed and there is no shortage of investors waiting to buy them. For these companies and individuals, Manchester is seen as a golden opportunity. But while the appeal of the city's residential market is hard to dispute, there's always room for improvement. My name is Dan Whelan, Senior Reporter for Place Northwest, and this episode has been brought to you by Alliance Investments. Today, we will be talking about why Manchester is so attractive to residential investors and exploring what it needs to do to improve its livability. I am joined by Louise Emmett, Managing Director at King's Dean, and Eric Agamian, Sales Director at Alliance Investments. Louise, Eric, welcome to the podcast. We're going to break down today's discussion into three parts. The first section, we will discuss Manchester's strengths and what makes it an attractive proposition for residential investors. In part two, we will delve into the areas where Manchester is not performing so well. And in the final part of the podcast, we will peer into the future and ask what Manchester's residential market will look like in 10 years time. So Louise, I'll come to you first. Give me a couple of headlines on what you think makes Manchester such an attractive proposition for residential investors. So Manchester has um, a phenomenal university um, and education system. And we've seen a huge number of um, graduates, actually, or students studying at the university, staying in Manchester. I think it has one of the highest graduate retention rates across um, the country. Uh, So that's always one of the top um, reasons why, you know, you should buy in Manchester. Um, And for me, the other thing is the football clubs. Um, I think Manchester has one of, well, the two biggest football clubs now um, in the world. And it is very well renowned for its football. Uh, not at, and at both sides of the city. Yeah, absolutely. Some Liverpool fans listening might take exception to that, but I think it's hard to hard to dispute. So, so the the student uh, aspect first. Yes, very high retention rate of of graduates, which that just drives demand, doesn't it? And one thing we always talk about when we're talking about residential in Manchester is that supply and demand dynamic, isn't it, Eric? It's the way that it is 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 um, kind of really good opportunity for investors to come in. Yeah, absolutely. I always think if you look at the commercial activity within a major city, it always helps underpin the residential market. So at present, you've got a record level of commercial office space that's under construction. I think last year was the highest it's been for over 15 years. There was 1.7 million square foot of office space built in Manchester city centre, which is very, very exciting. Um, And that's the highest level it's been for over 15 years. So if you think about it rationally, you have all of these large multinational corporations that are either setting up their headquarters here or expanding them here. That helps attract the highest caliber of professional tenants and it's great for the city. So from an investment point of view, you can see where the attraction is. So this all adds to that reputation of being a cool city, doesn't it? Tell us a bit more about that, Louise. Yeah, I mean, Factory International was one of the biggest um, events to happen in Manchester this year. You know, that space is just phenomenal, attracting worldwide um, access um, and, and then also with Co-op Live as well, due to open in um, April next year, which apparently I had a call with those guys this morning and they're already fully booked for two years. Oh, um, cool. And they're going to attract all sorts of music, uh, sporting events, and maybe even host the Brits, apparently. So. Yeah. I want to actually go back to your point about the football clubs, because um, I was speaking to someone not too long ago who, who said that what was holding Bristol back was the fact that Bristol has two football clubs as well, for those who are unaware, Bristol Rovers and Bristol City. Neither have been in the top flight for a very long time, if ever. Forgive me if there's any Bristol City or Rovers fans listening, but it really can't be understated, can it? That that sort of the reputational boost that having Manchester United and Manchester City in one place can have in terms of the the whole vibe around the place, Eric. Yeah, well, first of all, very well and truly puts in a global map. So between the two clubs, they generate over 1.2 billion in revenue to the economy each year, which is a phenomenal stat. And you only have to see the level of tourism as well on match days. So you're going to see people from Ireland, you're going to see people from America, from Scandinavia. Yeah, absolutely amazing for the city. And again, it helps put it very much on a global map. And we're now lucky in a way from a property point of view, 
there's no longer this obsession that there was with London, say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you spoke to anybody overseas. They thought it was just mainly London. Mm. And now you see so many other countries very much interested in Manchester from a tourism point of view and also a business point of view. So great yeah. for the city. In terms of investors, are we seeing quite a lot of people who can't get into the London market looking to Manchester? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we always say Manchester is is way more affordable than, than London from every perspective, in my opinion. Um, I always say Manchester is a walkable city. You can still walk from one side of the city, Ancoats, New Islington, Piccadilly, all the way to Castlefield um, within still 25 minutes. Um, so it's a very cost-effective um, city to live in. Okay, and, and in terms of the, the figures... You know, when an investor's looking at the spreadsheet and he's comparing different places and he looks at Manchester, what are we talking in terms of yields and, and return on investment? Give us a bit of an insight into that. Sure. It's actually fascinating even speaking to London-based clients because when you speak to them, they can't believe the rents that are now being achieved in Manchester. So in a typical luxury city centre development, it's quite normal to get 2,500, 2,700, 2,900 a month in rent. So going back to the point I made about commercial office space, this is what's forced rents to increase by 19% over the last 12 months. So just over the last year alone, this is how much rents have increased. So all of a sudden you have London-based investors that can get a much better return on investment, a higher yield of maybe 6 7%, maybe more, compared to maybe 2 to 3% in central London. And they also know they're going to benefit long-term from the growth. So all in all, it's just that perfect combination of capital appreciation, rental growth, the two key factors to a successful property investment. Okay. And I'm, I'm interested to know, just before we go back to a few of Manchester's strengths, and there are plenty, um, who is investing in, in residential in, in Manchester? What's the, the demographic? Are they mainly overseas? Are we seeing people from homegrown investors as well? Can you give us a bit of insight into that, Louise? Uh, yeah, I'd say a mix. Uh, we have definitely seen a lot more overseas investors, I think, and the, um, the football clubs help with that. But also the fact that the airport is, you know, the largest airport outside of London. Um, with I don't I think five or six flights a day to um, the Middle East, which just shows the pull that Manchester now has, um, and the amount of overseas students that we have studying in Manchester as well. So yeah, I'd say it's a good mix, sort of split fifty fifty between overseas investors and UK investors as well. Yeah, Eric, do you want to add to that? Yeah, similar. A very very broad range of purchasers, varying from parents buying for their children that are in university, people looking as a second place to live. Uh, somewhere they're going to visit. Uh, you have people downsizing from other cities. Um, the job prospects and the growth prospects now in Manchester compared to 10 years ago are perceived to be of a much higher value. So that's why now, going back to Louise's point about the student retention rate, if you've got a child and you want to send them to university, you can safely send them to Manchester knowing that when they finish their job, they've got exceptional job and growth prospects on their doorstep. And that's a key factor that helps drive that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the city council's role in all of this as well, uh, because they're often um, highlighted, you know, among local authorities across the country as being a very proactive pro-development local authority, make it easy for developers to come into the city and and deliver. They give developers certainty. And people say when they come into the city, they can't believe the number of cranes, the amount of, of development activity going on especially when they compare it to other places. So how big a role do, does the council play, play in all this, in making the city attractive to residential investors, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's they make it easy, as you say. Um, the planning process isn't, isn't the easiest uh, process to go through, but Ma uh, Manchester is definitely one of the better um, cities that, that help it along the way. And I think Manchester encourages development um, it doesn't discourage development. You know, they they see the benefit of, you know, good quality residential and commercial developments to aid the growth of the city. Yeah, and they're not small schemes either, are they? They're, they're quite large schemes. Yeah, they're happy for developers to sort of go out on a limb and do something different, really showcase what Manchester can do. Yeah, well, we've seen in recent weeks, you know, alone massive proposals come in for for residential towers in the city centre, right in the city centre as well, which is really good to see. Um, I think it's Ian Simpson from um, Simpson Hub Harvard Architects likes, likes to talk about how there used to be no people living in Manchester city centre and now there's there's loads, let's just put it that way. They expect it to grow as well and he wants to see it grow as well. Hmm. Um, I think they're very commercially minded. They're very open-minded, they're commercially driven. 
and it makes it a very attractive proposition. And now this is what is attracting investment from all over the world. It's not just for UK-based developers that are developing in Manchester. If you look at the likes of Investec, one of the biggest South African banks, uh, they're developing, I think, half a million square foot of office space just off the Innsgate and yeah. the uh, You've got various multinational corporations from all across the world now. And a lot of that is down to the council because they know there's the potential. So it's very, very important for the city. It's important that we maintain that, mm. that outlook. So yeah, very, yeah. very good. Manchester City, I think their slogan is we're always open for business, Mm -hmm. which I think is, you know, key, isn't it? That they're always willing to talk to anybody about any developments that they think will be great for the city. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important as well to to sort of back that up with action as well. It's all well and good saying it, but they've backed it up for years with with action. Now, obviously, this is sounding a little bit like a Manchester loving at the moment. We will get on to some of the areas it needs to improve on um, shortly. But I want to go back to your point, Eric, that you've been making about the uh, the commercial development going on because obviously residential is great and that is growing, but it's just one part of a of a jigsaw, isn't it? And and one thing that is that is driving the commercial growth is is Midas, so the the Inwood Investment Agency, which other cities yep. they they don't all have, and that's a real a real key, isn't it, for bringing those businesses into the city? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can look at real life examples just to give an indication of that. So, for example, with Alliance, we're building a major development with Starwood Capital, based in America one of the largest hoteliers in the world. They have some four to five billion worth of assets under management. And it's incredible for the city that they're investing in it. I mentioned the other companies. Um, there's various multinational corporations that are spending money. Uh, you look at the likes of Landsec, one of the biggest developers in London. In fact, one of the largest, if not the largest commercial developer and investor in the UK. They are investing 750 million. They bought a majority stake in Media City. They're developing um, Mayfield. the air, Mayfield, that was it, thank you, next to Oxygen, um, next to Piccadilly Station. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely incredible for the city. Um, you look at the expansion at First Street, that land is owned by some of the biggest investment funds in the world, Patrizia Mobilion, based in Germany, um, and they're pumping money consistently into this area. So, again, it's well and truly on a global map. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just on the rents point, um, I've got a few figures here. So, um, Predicted rental growth by 2027 of 21.6% from now, and that's already taking into account the significant growth we've seen over the last two years. That's great for residential investors, isn't it? Um, they'll be they'll be pleased uh, with that. But is there a risk of of the market overheating? Is there a risk of um, rents getting to a point where it's just unachievable for Manchester people, shall we say, to afford to live in the city centre? Because that's one of the concerns that that we hear sometimes. Yeah, um, but I think the quality of the buildings that people are living in now warrant the uplift in rents. And there is a huge, as we've already discussed, supply demand imbalance in Manchester. You know, we are seeing far more people wanting to be in Manchester than developers can build because, you know, every scheme takes a good sort of four to five years in the pipeline. So even the schemes that are in the pipeline today won't be delivered until 2026, 27. Um, and every day, every scheme is always moving that barrier for improving the barrier and better amenities. And I think the buildings that people live in today aren't just your home. You you create communities, you make friends, you've got your social aspect in there, you've got gyms, you've got swimming pools, you've got cinemas. It's not just a home anymore. So you're actually getting more bang for your buck, so to speak, yeah. because it's not just a rent yeah. for your apartment. I think we're talking quite a lot today, aren't we, about the, the new developments in Manchester, and rightly so, because as you say, Louise, the amenity is incredible. These are sort of top of the range, uh, for want of a better phrase, homes um, with all the amenity. From an investor perspective, what are the, what are they? How are they viewing the the older stock that perhaps doesn't have this amenity? Quite simply, in a major city such as this, you always have a market for both. You always have the top end luxury residential, five star developments with incredible amenities where the highest caliber of professional tenants will go. And you'll have the, some of the older stock that perhaps doesn't have the amenities, but it's reflected in the price. Mm-hmm. So there's so much demand there, there's enough to cover all of that, those aspects. Okay. And we can see it as a concern. Yeah, and you're covering like a wide range of bases for the, the buildings that people want to live in. Like I personally wouldn't want to live in a building of 500 apartments, but I would prefer to live in a smaller building. So you do, there'll always be a... Um, room for every aspect of stock. And are you seeing that reflected in the in the sales? Yeah, I mean, sales is a little bit different because 
that the older stock generally has cladding problems so there is a lot of a long way to go in relation to releasing that stock back to the market okay. um but that's the beauty of new build for investors they're getting a, a product that's you know built to the highest quality of um built as build it in standards yeah and that's that's interesting isn't it because that sort of suppression of that part of the market because of the cladding issues that you mentioned and we'll come on to that shortly is kind of adding to the supply and demand dynamic that we're seeing isn't it and it's making the the new stuff even more desirable and driving those values up even more so it's an interesting dynamic at the moment isn't it in the market um fantastic well i think we've, we've spoken just about enough of manchester's strengths uh, we recognize there are there are many it's a cool city two fantastic football clubs a lot of commercial development uh, high value jobs um, and a proactive council and scope to build tall and dense. Let's move to part two, where Manchester needs to improve. So Louise, if you were going to say, as a Manchester resident, if you were going to say one thing about how the city needs to improve to make it more livable and a more attractive prospect to residential investors, what would you say? I mean, my big thing is always green space. Like Manchester it is renowned for not having enough green space. Uh, Mayfield, you know, the, the first park or man-made park that we've had in the, in the city for years is absolutely fantastic. And to see children playing on that playground is, you know, incredible to see. Um, so for me, yeah, 100%, we need more green space. Okay. And that, how how do we deliver that? Because that's, that's the difficulty, isn't it? Because I agree with you. I think everyone would agree with you. We'd love to see a big, you know, central park like in New York or a Vondel park like in Amsterdam. But... I can't for the life of me think where it would go. Are there any solutions? Eric, can you think of any solutions to this problem? Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> and, and look, we appreciate in a major built-up city such as Manchester, it's always going to be difficult. But yet in an ideal world, it would be a designated space similar to that. We may have to compromise in the actual location and have it slightly outside the true or what people perceive to be the true heart of the centre. Mm. That's probably the most realistic way um, to do that. Yeah. That it, we have to make the most of what we've got, you know, Parsonage Gardens, like outside where we are today, you know, that's it, a beautiful green space, but tiny. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and then also, I, I guess, have a building or incorporating green space into new build developments, you know, like a lot of developers are doing now via roof gardens and roof terraces, so that at least within the building, you've got somewhere to go or outside space. Yeah, I think that's one of maybe the criticisms leveled at the City Council who we have said are very pro-development. And um, I think sometimes they're criticised for not demanding more from developers in terms of contributions towards things like green space and transport improvements, perhaps, and affordable homes, which we will come on to shortly. Um, Eric, same question to you that I asked Louise. If you were looking at Manchester now um, from a, a investor's perspective, um, and maybe tell us about what you're hearing from investors as well, yeah. what do they want to see improved in Manchester? First of all, from a personal point of view, we were speaking about this off air. Again, we appreciate it's a major city. Parking is always a bit of an issue. Getting in and out of Manchester, I think the perception of the public is, I'm going to use the tram, I'm going to use the train. But in terms of getting into city centre office space, for example, it does make it challenging. Mm -hmm. So how do we improve that? I think we've got to look at the transport system to hopefully one day have aspirations to have it as close as possible to somewhere like London, mm -hmm. which but makes it very, very interesting. Yeah, That's probably one of the one of the key issues. Yeah, on, on transport, it's been the aim of Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, for as long as he's been in, in that particular post to build a, a London-style transport system. Uh, we have the Metrolink, which is pretty good. You know, it doesn't go past my house, which is upsetting, but um, everyone wants the Metrolink, which shows what a prized asset it is to the, to the city region. But looking more um, further afield, obviously there was the news about HS2 in October that that is being scrapped. It, has that had any impact on investor sentiment in terms of Manchester as a as a viable proposition? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I mean, for me, getting to London takes two hours on the train anyway. You know, mm -hmm. um, HS2 would have been a nice to have, but you know, Manchester won't. It it won't be a detriment to the city. Yeah. Are, yeah, same answer. I think there's so many things that are happening in Manchester. I've not, to be honest, even heard HS2 mentioned as a key factor when when an investor is formalizing their opinion of whether they're going to buy in Manchester or not. It maybe for other smaller cities it was it was more in the spotlight. Yeah. But for Manchester there's just so much else happening it it really really makes it irrelevant. The mm. connectivity across the country is more important, you know, like Leeds to Liverpool. Yeah. 
more important to be honest absolutely. for for the city for the region yeah the whole absolutely i think yeah like you say eric the, the impact it's had on other places crew for example and yeah. you can read the latest on place northwest about what's happening at uh, cheshire east council after hs2 was scrapped mm -hmm. but yeah for manchester which is where it is on its journey less of an impact for sure um i want to go back to um a point that you mentioned uh, just a little bit earlier louise about the planning process which is not a manchester issue it's a national issue but that has an impact as well doesn't it especially when manchester is in such need of more accommodation that planning system is just simply not quick enough is it yeah no and like i say manchester is on the whole okay compared mm -hmm. to look i know london is an absolute nightmare um, but yeah, the longer the planning system takes, the longer it takes to get properties and apartments built mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and slows the whole process down. But for investors who already own apartments in the city, are they looking at that as a positive? Because it's keeping the supply down and it's maybe pushing their values up, Eric? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you look slightly outside of our region. If you go to somewhere like York, beautiful historic city, but it's well renowned that the planning application process there is absolutely horrendous. Mm -hmm. They're obviously obsessed with protecting the views of the Minster and there's only a certain height that you can build to, and it's a very long and drawn-out process. Yeah. I, I want to ask a little bit about the comparisons with London again, because it's cheaper yeah. to buy here, the rents are lower, yeah. which makes it probably more accessible to, to investors. But does that then mean that your returns aren't as, aren't as great? Because well, explain to me as a lame, and you're shaking your head, Louise. <laughs> um, no, well, I, I think I, the returns here are higher than in London, um, well, okay. just because the, the values are so much higher in London. Um, I mean, I, specifically, I couldn't really comment, but I mean, I don't even think you can get a one bed for less than 600,000, 700,000 for a one bed in London. Um, well, whereas here, you can still get one beds for 250, 300,000, so half the price. And now, the, with rents rising, the yield is, is so much better here. Yeah, it's a much more attractive proposition. So you've got the annual rent as a proportion of the purchase price. The yields in London are much lower because the values are higher. Whereas here you can still get in at a reasonably good level and actually get a higher return. So in simple terms, you can buy a two-bed here and rent it for 2,800 a month. You'd spend maybe 350k. In London, that same apartment will cost you 650k. Okay. So it's a huge difference. Is there a danger then? I'm trying to pick holes here, but is there a danger that... Um, so investors are looking away from London to Manchester for better returns. What happens in five years' time? And I'm jumping the gun a bit here. We'll get to this properly in part three. But what happens if, you know, everything continues to increase in, in Manchester and then do we get to a point where Manchester becomes like London is now and people start looking at Liverpool or Leeds? Is, is that just how the cycle goes? I, I don't think Manchester... I don't, it's, it's so hard. I don't think Manchester will ever get like that because I'd say Manchester is still one city, whereas okay. in London you've got li little cities... It, in, as part of a bigger city, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Whereas I think Manchester will always have that that compact feel, no matter how big. I mean, it can only grow so big, obviously. Um, but I think Manchester will always feel quite compact as a city. Yeah. And there will always be a ceiling price. Okay. Well, I'll give you an example. I first moved over to Manchester from Ireland in 2004. So you remember the big hype at the time. There were no new built luxury residential buildings. There was one that became available, Beetham Tower, the Hilton Hotel. You remember the excitement, but also there was a certain element of risk. They were like, can Manchester sustain this? Is this, have they got this confused with London? It's not going to happen or it shouldn't have happened. They'll never sell. It's too expensive. And now we fast forward, what, 15 years and you look at the amount of skyscrapers mm. in the city. So yeah, I'm personally excited as to what's going to happen over the next 10 years. And sorry to throw a geeky stat at you. So earlier this week, you probably missed this. So Manchester launched a 10-year economic strategy mm. by the council. So they're pledging a further 13 billion worth of GDP worth of residential and commercial developments over the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah, it's not That's slowing it. down. It's not slowing down. Mm -hmm. It's said to create 70,000 new jobs. Yeah. So I think in this instance, there's that perfect mix of not just residential buildings being built. If that was the case, then it would be an issue. Yeah. There would be a case of oversaturation. There would be a case of people not being able to afford to buy. I think when you've got the combination of both, that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it exciting. Yeah, that brings me nicely onto my next question, Louise, about land availability. Because we, we always hear um, on the news desk, you know, this is the last prime site, the last city centre site, and every time that we get, you know, information like that, it's getting further and further out. So, 
is is it the case that the amount of prime in inverted commas land is is running out or is it the case that the city is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it will continue to do so yeah that's it but the city is getting bigger and bigger and for me prime depends on where you want to live like some people for me i live in Ancoats New Islington and so for me that's a prime part of Manchester mm. to live whereas other people prefer Castlefield and they will say that's a prime or some people just think that M1 is a prime postcode so they want to be an M1 mm. so prime for me has different connotations to to the the end user um, and the city is just growing further and further out um, with, with what FEC are doing at, um, over at Victoria, Victoria North, North. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what you know, every, uh, what's happening at Jack, New Jackson, yeah. um, Salford. You know, I think having Manchester and Salford working together as a city is fantastic. And, that, uh, you know, the apartments that if you live in Salford, you're looking back at Manchester, so you've got some fantastic views of the city. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it does depend on what your view on Prime is and yeah. where you want to live. Yeah, absolutely. And then another thing I wanted to raise was around variety. That There's often accusations of a lack of variety of accommodation in, in the city. Lots of one and two bedroom apartments um, with for good reason. But we were talking, Louise, before we recorded about townhouses and three bedroom apartments. There's simply not enough of them, is there, at the moment? No, and you know, that does come down to a viability issue, you know, in a city like this where where everyone is trying to get height and scale, then, you know, you do naturally um, fall back on one and two bed apartments. But yeah, we are seeing a huge demand for townhouses. You know, there are a lot of young couples who would like to have more space, who would like to start a family and stay in the city. But at the moment they can't and they are, they do have to leave the city. Um, And students like to live in apartments now in, in the heart of the city. So we find three-bedroom apartments are really, really popular with investors. They get snapped and, up quite quickly, yeah, do they? Because, well, A, nobody really builds them, so there aren't many around. And B, their yields are really good. Because they're let to students. Yeah. Okay. Well, not necessarily because they're let to students, but a three-bed you can rent for is split between three people. Mm-hmm. So you get a really good yield on that. Mm-hmm. And more affordable. Yeah. yeah, in an ideal world, we could build more three-bedroom apartments. From an investment point of view, it makes sense for people sharing and being able to share bills and council tax. Makes it a lot more affordable. So yeah, in an ideal world, more townhouses and more three bed apartments. But again, I think in time we will see the city, going back to your previous point, expanding, mm. getting further out. Where Louise lived ten years ago, Great Ancoats, that was there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. And now you've got this huge inward investment there. And naturally this could the city's gonna get larger. Yeah, absolutely. And then also I think that we're seeing quite um older pe- older people wanting to move back into the city as well, you know, when their children have gone to university and they're rattling around in a four bed house in suburbia mm. when actually they could just live in the city and have the life that the you know, restaurants, bars, theatres don't want to be going out every night, but just to be able to, to have those on their doorstep and walk home rather than having to get a taxi. Mm. I think we are really missing a trick with that sort of later living and like of life absolutely in the city. they're the ones with the disposable income Inc- aren't they and freeing up houses in suburbia for young families um let's move on to the final part of today's podcast where we will cast the mind forward about 10 years uh, it's an arbitrary figure but we have to stop somewhere what do you think we will be saying about manchester's residential market both good and bad in 10 years time eric we'll start with you I think we're going to be amazed at the scale of development, just purely from the plans that have been outlined by the council, by this very positive initiative to attract more inward investment. And I think, interestingly, there's a nice balance. There's a nice balance of not just commercial and residential developments. You look at the quality of office space. You look at the green space we touched on will hopefully expand. You look at the restaurants, all the leisure amenities, the tourism industry, which is a huge factor. For the city, I think it, it's going to get a lot more spectacular. Where will rents be? Ooh, rents still cheaper than London. <laughs> Excellent, good answer, uh, Louise. Where where do you see us in ten years' time? Yeah, I, I mean, I really hope that we will see a wider variety of of available properties, and we will see a wider variety of um, sort of demographic and age living in the city, and um, that would be a really good place. For the city to be, I think, to have that sort of wide range of demographics. So it, 
you've got every sort you, you're covering every base so to speak mm-hmm. and like, more, more parks from, yeah, it? from the students all the way through to you know older people yeah absolutely um that is all we have time for on today's episode a huge thank you to louise and eric for joining me this episode of the place northwest podcast was brought to you by alliance investments to learn more about alliance investments you can go to alliance-investments.com and for all the latest property news from across the northwest visit placenorthwest.co.uk and subscribe to our free daily news briefing thank you for listening i hope you can join us again soon Thank you.